Hey guys, we're here at Larson Motorsports for another virtual field trip. And today we're joined by none other than Winston Scott. Winston, why don't you tell the students a little bit about yourself? Absolutely, I'd be very happy to do that. I'm Winston Scott, as you said, and uh, I'm a retired U.S. Navy captain, naval aviator, and NASA astronaut. I spent 27 years on active duty in the Navy, and then seven of those 27 were with NASA as an astronaut. My background in the Navy, I said naval aviation, I flew many, many, many different kinds of airplanes in the Navy, but the prime one was the F-14 Tomcat. And if you're not familiar with airplanes, that's okay because no matter how young you are in the audience, you are familiar with the movie Top Gun with Tom Cruise. Well, the airplane that the Cruise actor flew in the, in the movie, I flew for real. That was my main airplane. Two space shuttle missions as an astronaut, nine days on Endeavour, which was the newest of the shuttles, 16 days on Columbia, which was the oldest of the shuttles. I was the flight engineer for both uh, flights. That means I was part of the flight deck crew. I actually flew the vehicle, but my main job was spacewalking. I got to put the spacesuit on and go outside. And I conducted three spacewalks, or EVAs as we call them, extravehicular activity, three EVAs over my two space flights. That is awesome. So, okay, you're sitting here today and you've accomplished so much, but how did you get started? Like, what was that fire in your belly? What was the thing that made you want to say, I want to be an astronaut? <laughs> I was always interested in science, engineering, technology, and aviation, even as a little kid. Okay. I didn't think I could do it as a little kid, but as I matured and grew up, I realized that anything was possible. So when I left college, I joined, again, I went into the Navy, and we did Navy flight training, and Navy flight training was my ticket to the astronaut program. In fact, all of the pilots in the astronaut program now still come from the military, either Air Force or Navy. Scientists do not. You don't have to be in the military to be an astronaut, but uh, the pilots all still come from the military. But uh, space flight, aviation, engineering, and science is something that I've always been interested in because it's just so fantastic, so exciting to me to be around the machinery. So Talk to me about your training, okay? I mean, you're a pilot and you flew the F-14, and by the way, Top Gun is coming back out. Sequel to Top Gun, that's right. That is exciting. <laughs> I'm gonna be there because I'm gonna tell I will you be there. That, that just got, I think that got a whole younger generation yes. re-excited yes. about being in aviation Absolutely. and flying and doing all this thing. So, Absolutely. Okay, so you had a great career. How many years were you in the military? And then Well, again, uh, 27 total in the military, mm -hmm. but the last seven of the 27 were with NASA as an astronaut. So what made you wake up one morning and say, okay, I'm gonna take this to the next level? I've always been the kind of person that wanted to take things to the next level. I was raised that way. My father and mother always taught us that you always want to strive for something higher. No matter where you are, you want to push yourself and to stretch yourself and to achieve higher. So the uh, astronaut program was the next step up for what I was al already doing in the Navy. I was I started out as a Navy pilot, I could do a junior pilot, and then worked my way up to be section lead, division lead, flight lead, uh, production test pilot, and so on, and then research and development test pilot, and then the next step up for a pilot, the highest you can go would be to fly in space. So I was just looking for a new challenge, a next, another step up, and uh, I applied, and lo and behold, I was so fortunate to be selected. So. What did your family think of this? Uh, it, you know, becoming an astronaut changes not only your life, but changes other people's lives. It changes the lives of your family members, your cousins, uncles, aunts, your uh, friends, acquaintances, your neighborhood. My whole neighborhood has, has changed, and uh, it, it, it's a good thing because uh, it reflects on them. And, but it, it's so exciting for, for everybody, not just for me. You know, um, people always ask me, because I drive a race car, like, did you ever see yourself doing something like this? If you would look back and talk to yourself as a young boy, did you ever see yourself taking this path or? No, I did not. As I said, when I was a little kid, I loved uh, airplanes and airplane movies and space movies and Star Trek and Lost in Space and all of But I never thought I would do it. I right. didn't think I would do it. And it's a little different now because students are exposed at an earlier age than I was. That, you know, but because you're doing this, this, simul this broadcast mm -hmm. and students are exposed. We didn't have anything like this when I was a youngster in school, so I didn't think it was a reality to me in those days.
But yeah. uh, it, it's funny where fate takes you if you're prepared for those opportunities when they come. So there's a little bit more than what you see to Mr. Winston Scott, okay. okay? One thing that I know is that he is an avid musician. And how do you think that creative gene in you has helped you in your career? Because you love music. I do, I, I love music. In fact, I, I thought most of, most of my formative years, I thought I was going to be a professional musician. And I was always very, very good at it. Uh, the thought processes involved in playing music are the same as in, in mathematics. You know, they're, they're not different. People who do one usually are good at the other. Uh, it's not unusual that people who are scientists or engineers or physicists or whatever are also musicians. In fact, Einstein, Albert Einstein played violin. You know, Dang. yeah, even Mr. Spock played Vulcan harp on TV. So <laughs> it's just not all that unusual for, for a person that does one to do the other. So now we're setting ourselves up to where we are going to be going in space again yes. very soon, okay? When was the last time from American soil that we have sent someone in space? We haven't launched American astronauts from American soil since 2011. It's been nine years, that's way too long. That was the last space shuttle mission, 2011. Since then, for the students who don't know, our American astronauts have been flying in space with our Russian partners. And it's nice having good partnership with Russia, but we need to be launching our own astronauts from our own soil, and that's going to happen very soon. In fact, it could happen as early as this year. Absolutely. I know we live on Florida Space Coast, you know, and this is where a lot of all of the, the training, a lot of the launches happened. So where did you launch out of? Oh, well, I launched from, from here. All of our manned launches, well, manned obviously means mankind, not men, but all of our Man launches have taken place from here at Kennedy Space Center or the Cape Canaveral. So a lot of our training took place here. A lot of our training also took place in Houston. All U.S. astronauts, active astronauts, live in Houston, Texas. That's where we're based. Some training is done there, some training is done here, some training is done in Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, other space flight centers around the country. But all of the launches thus far have taken place right here from the Space Coast. So let's talk about your training a little bit, okay? Because you have to be, you're still very physically fit, <laughs> but you have to be extremely physically fit to not only go in space, but to fly, you know, jets and to do all that. Let's talk about the forces on your body, okay? I mean, I know from my G's in my race car, but that is nothing because my run is only about five and a half seconds. Tell me about how you train to become either a fighter, a pilot, or an astronaut. The, uh, the, the physical training is very important. First of all, I think you have to start out with a, a basically healthy person. You, know, you can't have any underlying illnesses or whatever to, to fly for the U.S. military or to fly for NASA. So you're already a, a healthy person. But part of your regimen is uh, physical training so that you can handle the G-forces. Now, you don't have to be an Olympic athlete, a weightlifter or anything, but you have to be in good physical shape and good medical shape. There are people who are professional athletes who may have a medical problem that will keep them from flying in space. And then people who, like me, I'm not an Olympic weightlifter or anything, but I don't have any medical problems. So it's, it's very important for students to take care of their bodies, to keep their bodies clean and healthy and strong, but, uh, but be in good physical condition also. We had an astronaut gym at Johnson Space Center. It's open to us 24-7. We had a staff on hand that, uh, of trainers, professional trainers, that could work with us. They could design a training regimen for you to uh, get you and keep you in shape and also to help you recover when you return from space flight. And of course, during my Navy days, my military days, the military requires you to be in physical condition and take a physical fitness test every six months. You have to do so in, in the military, no matter how long you serve. And so it, it's uh, physical fitness is a very big part of, of what we do. So talk to us about the weightlessness. Okay, and like the myths, because we've all seen all of these movies, you know, we've seen the Armageddons, we've seen the Gravities, we've seen the Martian, yes. you know, that's, that's what this generation knows about space, is what we've seen, you know, on the big screen. So, tell me what it feels like in training underwater, how do you train to be, you know, weightless? The, 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 there's no training you can do to really prepare you for continuous weightlessness. The first time you experience it is when you're up there. 
There's nothing you can really do to train for it. Those of us who perform space walks practice that underwater. Now, that suit weighs 350 pounds, and it still weighs 350 pounds underwater because you're in 1G. The water sort of floats the suit, and you pretend you're in weightlessness. So the suit is very, very bulky, and it's very, very difficult to work in. Underwater, I'm going to digress just a little bit. When you're practicing in that suit, you have a whole team of scuba divers under the water with you. They help you to practice and train for what you're going to do. They're also there for your safety because if something goes wrong underwater, you can't walk or swim in a 350-pound suit. The divers are there to get you out. Now, space is an amazing place because up there you can separate weight from mass. Once you're in orbit, the suit doesn't weigh anything, but you still have the 350 pounds of mass, plus your body mass, plus your tools that you're routinely moving. So physically, it's the most demanding thing that we do. And again, I mentioned we have a gymnasium in which we can work out, but the best way to physically train for walking in space is to do it in that 350 pound suit underwater. By the time you get to launch into orbit, you've worked out in that thing so many times that you are physically very strong. Your hands and forearms are tremendously strong so that you can manipulate your tools and your equipment in orbit. It's not unusual for astronauts to move five, six, seven hundred pounds of, uh, of mass in orbit. In my case, we had to manually capture a satellite in orbit, my buddy and I, on a spacewalk. That was a 3,000 pound satellite. So the two of us wrestled a 3,000 pound satellite in orbit and put it back into the payload bay. So uh, yeah, physical fitness is very, very important and uh, we have formal procedures to get you in shape, but the best way to get in shape is just putting that suit on and working it. And uh, while I'm talking about the suit, because it's so bulky and so difficult, everybody can't do it. Some of the smaller statute people can't handle the suit. And, and uh, of course, they get to sign other tasks. There are different people who have different specialties. My specialty happened to be spacewalking. So, I mean, I know the first time I got my very first fire suit and I put it on and put my helmet on for the first time and, and strapped in. Tell me about the moment when you actually became an astronaut and you got the suit on and it was the deal. It's the day, it's the time. <laughs> Tell me about what that felt like. It is absolutely incredible. There are no words to describe it. Um, my first flight, first, we first launched, we were launching at night. It's 2 o'clock, 2.20, whatever, in the morning. It's dark outside, obviously. We put our launch and entry suits on at, here at Kennedy Space Center in the suit-up room, and then we rode the crew transport vehicle out to the launch pad. And as you're approaching the launch pad, you're in this little silver bus that they may have seen on TV. And uh, you can see the shuttle in the distance as you, the convoy of vehicles is approaching it. And it's brightly lit up. It, it's so pristine. It looks almost like a, a model that somebody constructed. But as you get closer and closer, it gets bigger and bigger. And pretty soon, you're next to this huge thing. And it's, it's breathing because it's venting uh, gases. And it sounds like a beast breathing. Well, you ride the elevator up to the 195 foot level and then you begin to one, on, one by one get strapped in. And there, there are people up there that can help you get strapped into the vehicle. It sits up on its tail, as you know. So you have to climb in and wiggle up in it with your feet up in the air. And you have somebody to help strap you in, get your gloves on, get your helmet on, get your suit plugged in, all that stuff. We actually board the orbit of three, three and a half hours before actual liftoff. Now, finally, over those three and a half hours, you get down to the final seven seconds, and that's when the engines begin to ignite. And the computer will ignite the three main engines because they have to be started within a fraction of a second of each other. So you're lying there, the clock's counting down, seven seconds, and all of a sudden it starts shaking and vibrating and rumbling. And all this smoke and fire billows up around the front, around the front windscreen. And I can remember sitting in my seat looking at the gauges, the engine gauges as they all came up to speed, shaking and vibrating, and smoke and fire billowing up around the, around the front windscreen. And just as I'm about to say to myself, aren't we supposed to be going someplace? The clock hits zero and the solid rocket boosts ignite and then all of a sudden, boom, it explodes off the pad. And on TV, it looks like it floats up in slow motion because it's so big. In reality, it, boom, it kicks you in the butt as it jumps off the pad, shaking and vibrating. You pass 100 miles per hour before you clear the tower. No. That's right, before you clear the tower. You yeah. finally clear the tower, then it rolls kind of upside down and sort of shoots across the horizon. It's pushing you back into your seat, very, very gradually building up the, the transverse G. 
we pass Mach 1, the speed of sound, in roughly 45 seconds. And the thing that's so amazing about it is that it never stops accelerating. It reaches 3Gs. 3Gs may not sound like much, but 3Gs transverse oh. is a lot. It's yeah, no, no it's a lot. Car. Yeah. yeah, yeah you, uh, no, mine aren't sustained like yours. No, no it's not the same, but yeah. you probably reach you 3 hit it. Gs. Yeah, you hit it. You're right back down. And then it's right down. But we hold 3Gs for probably three or four of the eight minute ride orbit. It's pushing you back and you just to get three times your body weight. And um, we, that's why we were able to go from zero miles per hour on the pad to 17,500 in only eight and one half minutes. So it's an amazing eye-watering ride. In fact, I was talking about that first flight. We launched at night, dark outside obviously, but about halfway through the ascent, I could look out of the front windows and see the day half of the earth coming. We launched at night and there's the, the terminator, that line between night and day, and then all of a sudden, there's the day half of the Earth and we just shoot from darkness into light as we, as we reach orbit. And then we're going so fast, we go around the Earth over and over again every 90 minutes. You completely circle the entire globe every 90 minutes, this fast. How can you even, I mean, in my mind, number one, I have goosebumps because <laughs> that's like a ride that I want to try, okay? You would love it. I mean, but it's like, how can you even, I mean, you put it into words, but dang, I mean, that is fast. That's fast. I mean, yes, we see is. like the videos of their, uh, yes. you know, the uh, cheeks and all that kind of stuff, yeah. you know, but I mean, <laughs> it's, it's one thing, but how much control do the astronauts have of the launch process? The launch is automated. If everything goes well, it's automated. We practice, we spend more time practicing it manually in case something goes wrong. We can take over and do anything. But on every flight, almost every flight that I know of, everything has gone along real well. The computers handle the entire launch sequence. We're all monitoring our systems and things like that to be sure they work properly. The commander had some, pilot had some, I had some systems I was watching to be sure they are. So if everything goes well, the launch sequence to low Earth orbit is automated. Once we get to orbit, if we have to do either what's called an OMS-1 or OMS-2, OMS is Orbital Maneuvering System. Once, once you get to orbit, you have to adjust your orbit. When you get there, you're in what's called an elliptical orbit. It, for those who, if you don't remember your geometry, an elliptical is kind of like a football. So the Earth is round, our orbit is oblong, kind of like a football. Well, we don't want that, we want a circular orbit. So we have to do what's called an ohms burn. That means we fire the engines at the appropriate time for the appropriate length of time to circularize our orbit so that we're flying in a circle. Then we might want to adjust our altitude. See, we get to main engine cutoff, but that may not be high enough. We may want to go higher than that. So we'll calculate another burn, fire the engines the appropriate time for the appropriate length of time to get us up to where we want to be. So those things are done manually. So a lot of flying in, in orbit is done manually. A lot of flying is done by the computers. But the crew can do anything manually from takeoff, orbit, uh, how many ever days you're up there, and come home. We can, all, we can do it all manually. So you've kind of taken us through the process, but I forgot to ask one thing. When you're getting ready to go for the launch, what do you tell your family back home? Like you leave them, how long? from when you leave them, do you actually, can you go into space? Like in movies, they show that you have to go into quarantine before. We do. All of that kind of stuff. Like, what was that like leaving your family? Well, you've been leaving your family off and on during your, your training period. You know, you have trips here and trips there for training. So you're going a few days, you know, a week here and then and back. So they've essentially, they know what you're going through. So it's kind of preparing them also for what you're going to do. And NASA does a very good job of that. As the mission gets closer, they'll even bring the family members into the simulator building. They might let the, the families ride the simulator a little bit, so they kind of get them involved in what you're going to do. But basically, we leave them and go into quarantine for the shuttle program. It was about eight days okay. prior to uh, liftoff. Now, my spouse, my wife was able to see me in quarantine. She was cleared by the doctors. In quarantine, of course, you only eat what's prepared for you by the dietitians and only come in contact with people who've been cleared by the doctors. So we have uh, professional food preparers to prepare our food and then our wives or husbands can come and visit us during quarantine. So, but eight days worth of quarantine before we actually go into orbit. Quarantine is a really interesting period because you pass all of your heavy training. You're mentally preparing yourself what you're going to do. 
because over the previous year, you've been focusing on operations and engineering and tasks and spacewalking and flying and emergencies and all. You know, somewhere along the line, you gotta get to wrap your mind around what you're going to do. You're gonna strap yourself to right. 7.5 million pounds of explosive and go into orbit. And there have been times when it didn't work out so well, people didn't come back home. Well, let's so. talk about the psychological toll. Yeah. You know, I mean, like you said, I know it's like for me, before I go for a run, you're so busy, you're working with the fans, you know, the car is getting ready. But then there's that moment when you're in the seat, there's that moment before where you just take a breath and you realize what is about to happen, Absolutely. you know, Absolutely. and that's when it gets real. That's when it gets real. Yeah. Yes. Same thing with the, the space shuttle. It's, it, and it's that way every time you fly, but especially your first time. You know, I, oh, can, yeah. I can remember lying there again on my back, watching the clock count down. But it's, it's interesting, I wasn't afraid. People sometimes ask me, were you afraid? No, I wasn't afraid, I was excited. I want to get the show on the road. <laughs> let's let's light, this, light this baby and, and, and get rolling. And uh, it, fortunately, it all worked out well. You know, we didn't have any. So when you're there, okay, so you're there and you're ready to go, and it's time for you to do your work because you actually went into space to have, you had a job to do, right? Absolutely. It wasn't because they just wanted to see you to go for a joyride or anything like that, right? I well, mean, you had a task you at had hand. A task. Okay. No joyrides. No joyrides. It would yeah, be an expensive right. joyride. Yeah, that's right. um, so tell us about the task that you had to perform. Yes. Well, again, each, each day is jam packed with tasks. Some of the tasks are relatively small. They may be um, in a glove box or, or, or a research enclosure that's small. Some of the tasks may be really big, like a spacewalk, something like that. And uh, uh, we took, took quite a bit of engineering tests in the orbit with us because we were preparing for assembly of the International Space Station. So we were testing a lot of tools and equipment techniques that we use in building the International Space Station. One of the things that we took that was quite interesting was a robotic camera. This thing, if, if, if you see it, it looks like a big soccer ball but it's really a, a robot and its eyes are stereoscopic television cameras. And the idea is that we could use this robot to inspect the outside of your vehicle or your space station. Well, it's never been flown before, never been tested before, so we were gonna test it in orbit. So my job on one of my spacewalks was to take the robot out, power it up, run through a few self-tests, and then launch the robot, and then our pilot from inside the vehicle would fly it around in a test profile and the videos would be linked back to the shuttle and back to mission control. Mm -hmm. At the end of the test flight, he fly back to me and I power it down and put it back inside. And it worked beautifully. Really, really worked well. Had we had that device on Columbia in 2003, the outcome might have been different. But we flew on that one flight, no more funding, and that didn't get funding anymore. But an interesting project to work on. Another thing that I specifically had to do, again, space station related, back up a little bit. The International Space Station is built in a location in orbit that's colder, a lot colder than we used to go before space station. NASA modified the space suit to handle those extreme cold temperatures. And it was my job to test the suit. And the way I tested the suit was on a spacewalk during a night pass, because going on the dark side of the orbit, I actually anchored my body into foot restraints to hold me still and then they rotated me towards deep space to get me as cold as possible. And then I activated different devices on the suit and evaluated them and gave NASA a commentary on how well those devices worked to keep me warm during that dark side of the orbit. And of course the suit worked real well, it was a successful test, so they used that modified suit on building the International Space Station. And that's still the suit that they wear now when astronauts have to go outside and perform a space. That's what I was going to ask you. So how far has technology come from when you flew until now? I mean, what do you see that's, that's new, that's like late breaking? N N NASA technology is pretty much the same as it was when I was there. In fact, I was at one point, I was the lead astronaut for space station systems design. So I worked, my, my astronaut team and I worked with the contractors who designed, built, tested the space station. So that technology is pretty much the same. What has changed is access to space with the commercial private companies like SpaceX, Sierra Nevada, Blue Origins, and some of those. They have really revolutionized access to space. They've made it more affordable and more cost effective, which is good. I, I, I love it. So I, that, that's, that has been the change. The business end of space 
has, has changed. If you had a chance to go back up again today, would you do it in a heartbeat? I would. You know, I left when it was time for me to lose my choice. But if they were doing something new and different, I would love to go back again. If I, if I could get a trip to the moon, I yeah. would like that. See, the moon program was before my time in mm -hmm. the astronaut office. So I would love to go to the moon. It's a three-day trip out. You have you know, a couple days on the moon, come on back home. I can handle that. Yep. So what is probably the biggest misconception about being an astronaut and going in space? What is the biggest like myth that people think of that really isn't so? I'm not sure what the myths are. I had one person ask me, did I get paid a million dollars every time I fly in space? <laughs> Dude, <laughs> you wish, that's, right? that's one myth I wish were true. <laughs> no, 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 we go, we get, get paid your regular salary. But there are, there are quite a few, I guess, uh, uh, misconceptions they get from Hollywood. Uh, if you look at some of the, the space movies, the astronauts go up, uh, they, they launch into space, and then five minutes later, they've got the suit on, they're zooming all over, and they're singing songs, and the, I remember the one with uh, Sandra Bullock. Oh, uh, yeah, Clooney. yeah. Uh, gravity, I think. Gravity, gravity. gravity. George mm -hmm. Clooney. He's yeah. flying all over space, he's telling jokes and singing songs and all of that. Well, no, 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 not quite so. Yeah, yeah, a lot more serious than that. You yeah. don't just zoom all over space with the jetpack. You know, the jetpack is only for emergencies. There's very, very minimal fuel there. And if you happen to, heaven forbid, float loose in space, you can use the jetpack to float you back. Uh, so things like that. Again, Sandra, I, I love the movie, by the way. It's a, it a fun movie. Yep. But in one case, Sandra, the Sandra Bullock character used a fire extinguisher to propel oh, herself from one from the U.S. space station, which was exploding, all the way over to the Chinese. No, 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 no. That's Hollywood at its, as its finest. No. Doesn't quite work that way in real life. So there's also this, it was back in the day, because I'm back in the day with I Dream of Jeannie oh, and yes. all of, you know, that was, that was yeah. based here. But I remember going to Bowling Green, the Corvette yes. factory, and so there was this thing where they used to give all of the yes. astronauts Corvettes. Uh, now, did you get a Corvette? No. Dang it. They didn't give us, I'm still waiting on my, now I have a Corvette, as you know, I drive a Corvette, but that's, but that's mine, they didn't yep. give it to me. No, the original seven were uh, allowed Corvettes by the, a local Corvette company and they all drove them. Uh, a lot of astronauts still drive Corvettes, we enjoy it, but we don't, uh, we're not given Corvettes anymore. Okay, Chevy, uh, this is your opportunity. <laughs> uh, I see someone who needs the brand new one, right? <laughs> I was at an unveiling of the un new, brand new Corvette recently, and I kind of hit, hit to the deal. Hey, you know, maybe you want to kind of, but. I would be great publicity, yeah. yeah. Right. So I'm going to kind of take you um, on a little bit of a nostalgia and see if we can find some parts and pieces that maybe will uh, bring back some memories. Absolutely. We have a partnership with NASA and Rockets to Race Cars. Um, they feel like kids are interested in race cars, but we're really trying to get kids interested into space because Absolutely. they are gonna be that next generation yes. that takes us to the future and, yes. and beyond. Um, so we kind of have this display, so let's take a look sure. around and see what we can see. Absolutely. So obviously here's the shuttle. This yes. is the Atlantis. Yes. Tell us, like, how much would this whole unit weigh? This whole unit at liftoff, this mm -hmm. is called the stack mm -hmm. because it's all stacked up, I guess. This entire thing would weigh about 4.5 million pounds. And okay, wait a minute. You told me how fast this went yes. and it weighs that much? 4.5 million pounds. And for the students, your car, your family car probably weighs 3,000. This thing weighs 4.5 million, but we get it to fly because it generates 7.5 million pounds of thrust. 7.5 million pounds is a tremendous amount of energy. You could lift this building. But uh, the, the three space shuttle main engines, and I don't know if you can see these three engine bells on here, those are the main engines. They only generate about 1,900,000 pounds of thrust. The bulk of the thrust comes from the two solid rocket boosters, this one and the one on the other side. That's where the bulk of the thrust comes from. So when you launch, because I always see the separation and all that, okay, so when you launch, this launches and then that separates. The whole thing launches, uh -huh. that's right. You need these big solid rocket boosters to get you going fast enough and high enough that these can take you on in orbit. It's like, it, it, think back on the days when you're pushing somebody on a swing mm -hmm. or when you're pushing a car or whatever. It's hard to get it started, but once you get it started, it's easy, easy. to keep it going. Mm -hmm. You're pushing a little kid on the swing or you're in the swing yourself. It takes a lot of effort to get going, but once you get going, you can keep yourself going. Same thing here. You need a lot of energy 
to get you up and fast and out of the bulk of uh, the thick part of the atmosphere. And once, once you pass that point, two minutes in flight, that's the end of first stage, the solid rocket boosters are done. They are pa jettisoned away, parachuted back into the ocean to be reused. But now you've got enough speed and height that these main engines can continue to take you on into orbit. And the main engines use fuel, liquid fuel, out of the fuel tank. The fuel tank is that big orange one there. That has the liquid fuel in it. And how much yeah. fuel does it take? It takes about 500,000 pounds of liquid ox oxygen and liquid hydrogen Ooh. to get you to orbit. Notice the fuel tank is bigger than the vehicle. Mm -hmm because it takes so much, so much power. That's right. Nobody has a car with a tank bigger than the car, or a truck bigger than the, a tank bigger than the truck. truck. But here, the tank is bigger than the vehicle. So, and we burn all that 500,000 pounds up in only eight and one half minutes. That's how long it takes to get to orbit. So you, you're tr burning a tremendous amount of fuel to generate a tremendous amount a of, of energy and amount of power to get you in orbit. So when you lose all this, so let's talk about the landing procedure because now you're coming in and it's just landing like an airplane. That's right. right. There's only this part left. This part is called the orbiter mm -hmm. because it's the part that goes in the orbit. Okay. So so many days later, we do our deorbit burn, re-enter the atmosphere, and we navigate and fly our way home and we get ready to land. This part, as you can see, looks like an airplane. It it's a big glider. So you're coming down on final, and then the pilot will lower the landing gear, and the commander uses, is doing the flying, and the commander will land it like a big airplane. It's, it's a glider. It has no engines on landing. And how long of a landing strip, how long does it take to land something like this? The strip up at the, the runway, as we call mm -hmm. the shuttle landing facility, is 15,000 feet long. That's, that's a fairly long runway. There are a few of them in the world. But uh, you don't use all of that up. If you have a normal landing and, it, and let it roll until it almost stops by itself, you use maybe 8,000 feet of runway. Now, do they use parachutes? Yes, we have parachutes in the back to help slow us down. Okay. Once you land, like you do, yeah. and you're dra yeah. jet race dragster, the, we have a drag chute that comes out of the back to help slow us down and uh, aid in directional stability. And, the and do you feel down. the parachute hit when it comes out? No, Not really? You feel it. No? No, you can't feel it inside. Yeah? No. This and thing is big, it's, it's, it's massive, it's heavy. And yeah, it wouldn't. Heavy so how yeah. much does just this portion weigh? Oh, it, well, again, it depends what you have in it, but uh -huh. probably 200, 300,000 pounds, something like that. Like an airplane, like, like an airliner, airliner, something like that. And so obviously you're up here and yes. all of this is working space. All of this is working space. We call this the payload bay. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, this actually has a split, and the real one has a split, and the two doors are like clamshell doors, they open up. Mm -hmm. like that. So once we reach orbit, we have our orbit stabilized, mm -hmm. then we have to prepare to live in it. We have to make it in, from a, a rocket into a space station. And one of the things we do is we open these doors. The doors have uh, uh, cooling fins inside to dissipate all of the energy. And all of your equipment experiments and devices are inside here, like kind of like a big, big uh, truck bed. All kinds of devices, depending on your mission, what all you kinds of stuff. Depending so, I mean, we're right. looking at this right here, but where can they go to see something that they can see something real? I mean, this is just a mock up, right? Right here at Kennedy Space Center, K KSC Visitor Complex. Absolutely. You can see the real Atlantis up there. In fact, Atlantis is on, is on display. Mm -hmm. They can see it up close and personal, and uh, just getting, uh, just th that, that's it. Everything you ever wanted to know about space is, is there. And the cool thing about the Visica Complex is that it's not uh, a museum where you just look at dead stuff. You do things. You can touch it. You can feel it. You can turn it on. You can climb in it. And so it's just an incredible place. So they can see the real hardware. That's really cool. Well, yes. now let's take a look around. Let's start looking at, um, you know, we talked about the power in the parachute so this is part of like the parachute that would have yes. come out mm -hmm. ours is like um a nylon type of material probably the same for probably you probably the same thing but these are the parachutes that would power, that would uh, lower the uh, solid rocket boosters, boosters back into the water mm -hmm. because they were reusable everybody's excited because spacex is reusing their boosters and spacex is doing a tremendous job their boosters fly back and land mm -hmm. on the barge and some of the students may have seen that on tv mm -hmm. uh, but but NASA was reusing boosters a long time ago. Our boosters were so big and heavy, they can't fly back and land. SpaceX boosters are small. These things are huge. So they would parachute back into the water, and then we had retrieval ship. The ship would actually drive out 
there and hook the scuba divers would go out and they, they, they use compressed air to get all of the water out of these things because oh, they yeah. dropped in the, dropped in the ocean. That's yeah. right. And, they, and then they plug them up so they're empty and they're light and you hook them onto the back of the ship and the ship will drag them back to land and then they would be refurbished and reused. Hmm. Yeah. Now how would they guarantee that they would land in water? Well, that's why we launch easterly. Okay. If, you, if students ever noticed, all of our space launches launch out over the ocean. Two reasons. First of all, if something falls off or you have a, a problem, you don't want it to fall over land. And second of all, uh, we use the Earth's rotation to aid in getting us up to speed to go in orbit. And the Earth turns essentially from west to east. So if they've got a big globe sitting in front of them and the equator is here, the Earth is turning that direction from west to east that so we launch in that direction the earth's rotation gives us an extra that's boost that's and nice. we launch over water so we know the boost is going to fall over water. Right into the water that's right so now both of us kind of have a love of this little engine yes. this is a little general electric <laughs> j85 um it was introduced in the 1960s um it's still a cool little engine it sure is. so now you actually flew the plane yes. that had this engine now did you had two engines in your yes, plane right two, with afterburners yeah so this is a general electric j85 and what type of plane did you fly that had well, this engine the t-38 the nasa t-38, T-38. Mm -hmm. oh, no, or the f-5 is the fighter version of the t-38 yep that's what the, the t-38 are the little fighters that you, they see nasa astronauts fly for place to place, uh, for training and for transportation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now you flew the F-14, mm -hmm. which is the, the big guy, yeah, you know, that's big the big one and yeah. that's the fast one. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy, was this, did this have a lot of maneuverability? Was oh this my fun? goodness, yes. Yeah. The T-38 is one of the most fun airplanes that I, I've ever flown. In fact, I have well over a thousand hours, actually 1400 hours of first pilot time flying the T-38s. The engines were after burning engines also, mm -hmm. so it was a supersonic airplane. We mm -hmm. could go supersonic with it, fully aerobatic because it was a fighter. You know, yep. it's, it's built for combat. But yes, I, I thoroughly enjoyed flying the T-38s. And the NASA T-38s were not like stock T-38s. See, the Air, Air Force uses the T-38 to train its advanced jet pilots. Mm -hmm. NASA T-38s were a little bit different. We had upgraded systems, new, new systems, color weather radar. So I could travel in this thing, I could actually see what's happening in real time with the weather out in front of me because you always want to be concerned with where the thunderstorms are, where the hail is so you could avoid that. So we had just, they're just tremendous airplanes. I enjoy the T-38. That's much. the thing that I think is most amazing when I watch like um, jet pilots, how they're flying. Mm -hmm. I know for me, racing with this car, I go down a quarter mile and I'm down the quarter mile in five and a half seconds at mm -hmm. 280 miles an hour. Uh -huh. And it's about anticipating where you're going before yes. you get there. Yes, absolutely. So flying, how do you prepare yourself? Because before you think about it, you're already there. That's right. You exactly. understand what I'm saying? Exactly. I mean, yeah, you uh -huh. have to, you you have to anticipate everything, like you said, weather, other, other, you any do. obstacles. You do. You do. Yeah. And, and that's part of your training and, and part of why you stay proficient because you have to always be out, what we say, out front of the airplane. Mm -hmm. You have to always be thinking way down the, the, the road, so to speak, as to what's happening, not just with the weather, but fuel, of, of course, is important. You know, where your divert fuels are, where you, and what the systems are doing, and, and what happens if the weather is bad uh, at your destination. Because you don't have a lot of gas in these airplanes. No. Mm -mm. So you have to make decisions early and being out, and what we say, out in front of the airplane. Absolutely. Very important. Well, let's take another look down memory lane and see what else we can find. Now we're here to food. Okay, so for me, seeing how we're in rockets to race cars, in racing, I try to eat the same thing pretty much every day on race day to make sure that my body is ready to race. I'm, I'm ready to do everything I need to do for the day, okay? Yes. So how do you prepare? I mean, <laughs> what is this that we're looking at in food? Okay. Well, what you see here is just a sample of some of the food that might be in the space menu. And if we back up a little bit, remember, when astronauts train for space flight, at least in the shuttle days, we plan for a week or two weeks or whatever. And you could pick your menu for each day. There are professional dietitians that work with you to select your menu. I'm sure it's the same way on the space station, except they carry enough food for a much, much longer period of time. Uh, the dietitians will work with you to be sure that what you've selected in your menu gives you the right nutrients that you need up there. For example, on the day when I was going to do a space walk, 
they had to give me extra calories because I was going to wear that big bulky suit. I was probably not going to get any lunch. I would eat breakfast and then it might be 12 hours later when I eat again after I take that suit off after a hard day of spacewalking. So they wanted to be sure I had the appropriate nutrients and enough uh, carbohydrates and starches so I'd have the energy to complete the spacewalk. But <clears throat> once you select your menu, it's loaded and carrying the space with you. And then your menu is outlined for you every day. Each person uh, has a color code. Everything that belongs to an individual is color coded. All your clothing, your toiletries, your menu stuff, and so on. My color was green. So all of my foods had a green dot on it. The commander had a red dot and somebody else had a yellow dot and so on. So each morning we could get up and we could prepare our food. I could have scrambled eggs for breakfast or cereal or whatever I, did, I decided to. Here we have just a sample. Looks like, well, there's an orange grapefruit drink there. And um, obviously that package is flat. What you do is you have to insert that package on the end of a rehydration station and then oh. select the right amount of water. If we look on the label, it should tell us. It should tell us how much water. Oh, it's in Russian. No, oh, it's in, 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 okay, it's in English at the top. So 250 milliliters Please. of cold water for 2.5, 2 minutes. to 5 minutes. Yeah. So the machine, once you select that, will inject the cold water into it. You shake it up and then you let it sit for two, between two and five minutes. There's Velcro on there. It's probably on the back of the packet. You can mm -hmm. just Velcro it someplace. Then when you're ready to drink it, you stick a straw in the tip there uh -huh. and you can sip. But the straw has to be closed. There's a clip on the straw to close it up so that when you're not drinking the rest of the fluid, it won't float out into space. All of the food that's dehydrated has to be rehydrated in that manner. And if I'm looking at this, this is rice pilaf right here and you can see it's just a dry glob of stuff once you put the water back into it it looks like rice pilaf and was it, it tastes good like it. actually it's not <laughs> not bad it's not like a home cookie but not too bad if it needs seasoning you can't sprinkle salt and pepper because it floats all over the place we use liquid salt and liquid pepper no. yes the little squirt bottles with a cap on it so i would prepare my rice pilaf Hot water, obviously, for 10, let's see, I can't see the label, but it says 10, 15 minutes. 10 to 15 minutes, minutes yep. but and 100 milliliter hot water. So, put my water in there, let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes. Then I take my scissors, I have a pair of scissors, and snip the top of that cellophane. Take my liquid salt and a little squirt bottle about that high. Take the cap off, insert the nozzle, squirt a little bit of liquid salt, close it up. Take my liquid pepper, take the nozzle, squirt a little bit in there, put the cap in there. Let the salt and pepper permeate that. Now you've seasoned it up and then you can eat it. And you have to eat this very carefully because <laughs> your food will float away in space. That's what I was going to say. And you, you have, have to, to chase, chase it. it. <laughs> That's right. This other dish is what, teriyaki vegetables? Yeah. So yeah, you eat, you eat those. And this is baked beans in this packet over here. Baked beans. And baked beans. This looks like meals ready to eat here. It's sort of smashed up. So but is, it looks like, uh, what was your favorite MREs. meal? The best food on the space shuttle menu was shrimp cocktail. Really? Space shuttle shrimp cocktail was as good as any shrimp cocktail in any restaurant. When you look at it in the raw, it's just a glob of stuff. Uh -huh. But when you rehydrate it, it then it's moist and all. It looks just like shrimp cocktail in a restaurant and really, really tastes it's hot and spicy. Good stuff. Well, you know, um, I know here on Florida Space Coast and all throughout the United States, there is a program called NASA Hunch, and it's high schools yes. that come together. And I know the culinary arts programs are yes. actually working with astronauts to try to find out what their favorite foods are, how they can make them more appetizing, Absolutely. and to make sure that you, because you have to have dietary requirements, yes. you know, you have to make yes. sure you're hydrated, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so was there anything that you missed when you were in space that you didn't get to eat? Yes, you miss good old fashioned like cheeseburgers, pizza. <laughs> yeah. All the food in space is so pure. You get all the nutrients and it tastes okay, but most astronauts lose weight in space, including me. I was, I was even thinner then than I am now, you know, but I lost weight. I believe the reason you lose weight is because the food has all the nutrients, but it doesn't have any of the good stuff, the like calories, stuff, yeah. all the bad stuff in it. So. When you get back, you want a good old-fashioned pizza, a good old-fashioned cheeseburger with all the bad stuff so in it. What so what was the first thing you ate when you got back? Oh, goodness. The first thing I ate when I got back, I can't remember now. We got back so late. 
at night. Well, we landed early in the morning. It was a long day to come back. I think we had breakfast. I think we had regular scrambled eggs and breakfast, uh, sausages and bacon all, uh, for breakfast. And then by the time we worked our way home, because there were all kinds of ceremonies. President was there to meet us in Houston. So it was a long and ceremony. And so who was, was the reception. president? That president Clinton was in office president then. President Clinton. President Clinton was there to meet us at Johnson Space Center when we, when we flew home. And then we had a big reception that night. So by the time you get to your house with your family, you've been awake for well over 24 hours. You're dead tired. You try and sleep. Your sleeping cycle is thrown off. And then the next morning, you're back to eating your breakfast at home. If you eat waffles or pancakes or cereal or whatever. So, but yeah, you miss good old-fashioned uh, uh, bad stuff for you. Bad yeah. stuff. That's it. That's it. So now let's talk about, we talked a lot about our different suits, okay? So this is my original, my first exciting fire suit from the Mystifier days. Um, this is an SFI 20, so yes. it keeps me safe in fire mm -hmm. for about 45 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of bulky, thick, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Tell me about your suit. This particular suit is what we call a launching entry suit. It's the okay. one that we wear when we launch into orbit and then when we return from orbit. Once you're up there, you're in a shirt sleeve environment, except for those of us who do EVA. You put on the EMU, or the extravehicular mobility unit. That's a whole different suit. This suit is a partial pressure suit. See, your suit has to protect you from fire, but your atmospheric pressure doesn't change because you're on the ground. Here, we're going into orbit. So it's a partial pressure suit, it, and uh, what it does is it has bladders in it. And if the shuttle or the rocket should decompress for some reason, this thing will partially inflate. It will flow oxygen to you so that you can continue to breathe. It, it will attempt to keep you alive until you can re-enter the atmosphere and come home. A uh, liner underneath it, flotation gear. We have a parachute that we wear on the back because there is a very small window of opportunity in the launch profile where you can actually bail out if necessary on, on a parachute. Mm -hmm. Very short window, but you do have that. Then you have the helmet on top also that allows you to, uh, to breathe and to communicate and so on. So this is just the shell of the launching entry suit, but very, very uh, sophisticated device. If you look at these hoses coming out of the uh, hand, they, they pump air into the hand, so it's all a, a, a part of the uh, <clears throat> inflation capability of the suit. And also, you have to circulate air inside of this thing so that you don't get too hot. Because remember, we wear these things for five hours or more before we can, by the time you suit up, yep. to the time you get to orbit and take this off, it's probably five hours or six hours that you've been sitting inside of that launching entry suit. It's un uncomfortable. So gloves, I mean, I have these thick gloves that I wear. Yes. Tell me about your gloves and being able to maneuver. So there's something else I mean, working. I know you're a pilot. I know that you're a thrill seeker. I know yeah. that you have, what's your degrees? How many degrees? Tell me about well, all Well, aeronautical engineering okay. is my, my technical degree. Uh -huh. I also have a degree in music. Do you? Yeah, I have a, actually an academic degree in music. Uh -huh. So when you go into space, you have to use everything that you know in life to prepare you because you're yeah. not just one person in space. You're not just a pilot. You're not just right. a, a mechanic. You're not just, you have to be a jack of all trades. You do. You brought, you, you brought, your, your training broadens you out. Uh, for example, my degree, my, my technical degree is in aeronautical engineering, of course, which has to do with, with airplanes and spaceships and how they operate aerodynamics and stability and control and things like that. But uh, we also had to know quite a bit about electronics. I have a lot of uh, uh, elect electrical engineering courses. In fact, I taught electrical engineering as an adjunct for a while during my Navy days. But y you have to understand those things because you have to be able to interact and use and troubleshoot the various systems. For example, the computers on board the space shuttle were, they weren't nearly as powerful as the as computers we have today. In fact, your desktop today has more power, but those machines were very, very robust. And as an astronaut, not only did you have to understand how to use the computer, you had to be more than just the button pusher. In fact, some programs, some subroutines, we could access down to the assembly language and a lot of students may not quite know what the assembly language is, but the sim assembly language is the fundamental underlying engineering language that allows the computer to operate. When you turn it on and punch the keyboard, 
your keyboard punches are translated into a, an engineering language that the machine understands. understands. Mm -hmm. and, and also for the students, in some cases, we could actually understand the machine language. The machine language are the ones and zeros. All computers work on the binary system, a series of ones and zeros. Uh, and you can, you can express anything in a series of zeros and ones. That's called a binary system. And we as astronauts have to understand that because in some cases we can actually understand a change program down at the, the binary level. So your point is well taken that as an astronaut you have, to, you have your certain specialty, but then you have to understand other uh, disciplines also. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, because you are the first line of defense if anything goes wrong. If anything goes Probably wrong. Probably one of right. my favorite movies was Apollo 13. Yes, good movie. Tom Hanks is like the man. Yeah, you know he what is. I mean? Yes, He's he just is. the man. But I think yeah. part of my thing is, is like anybody can do anything if they have all the tools and the absolutely. equipment and all that. But what are you going to do when you have this box full of that's right. whatever, that's right. you know? And so exactly. that's what you guys had to do. Exactly. I mean, you had that's to right. make do with what you had. Mm -hmm. And now I know that they're thinking about, like, they're going to put 3D printers, 3D printers. and right. they're going to be able to print the things yes. that they need in space. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, yeah. We have, there are some 3D printers up uh, on the space station as we speak, mm -hmm. and they're printing uh, uh, fundamental components right now they're experimenting with and actually using the 3D printers up there. So yeah, you learn 3D printing. You have to, I mean, you have to understand something about material science when you're up there. Mm -hmm. And also, um, they're growing plants in space. And the, we grew plants in space, but they were at the laboratory level. We didn't eat them. Nowadays, they're growing plants and actually and eating eat some of the, the, consuming some of the plants that, that have been eaten. So there's just so much to do up there, such a wide variety of tasks. And that's what's so fun about it because you get a chance to learn so many things that you normally don't deal with. As a Navy pilot, I didn't have to deal with uh, plants, for example, mm -hmm. you know, growing lettuce or mustard in space. But I learned those things as, as an astronaut. As you went. That's right. Yep. Uh, well, let's talk about our seats, okay? Um, and let's talk about how you handled those G-forces mm -hmm. on your body, mm -hmm. okay? So this is my typical driver's seat. It's a poured seat, you know, and this is like my body in yes. my fire suit. This uh, is where my arms go. Yeah. Now, we took your cushion <laughs> off. This isn't like what That's you right. sat in, is it? <laughs> no, well, thank goodness. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. that would be a little hard. So tell me about uh -huh. getting buckled in, how many harnesses you have, and how you get ready. Yeah, and first of all, the seat would not sit straight up like this. It's actually lying down, you know, because okay. the rocket is and up so the seat would be inclined and uh, you, you climb in and you have to sort of climb your way up and, and, and wiggle your way up and, and lie down and your feet are actually sticking up in the air and like you say you've got cushions all over you've got hoses and power running into it electrical power also uh, hot, um, pneumatic power with, with uh, air and so on radio comms all is wired into the seat and uh, you have your parachute sitting up here and you climb in and you lie down and you have somebody to help you strap in. So you have a five point harness. So you've got four down here and two coming across the top and then one strap coming that way. Mm -hmm. And they all kind of fit into a quick disconnect yep. here. So you have to, you'd get strapped in with that, the seat belt just physically holds you to the seat. And in addition to that, you have all those other things that I just mentioned that, they, that have to be hooked up. Your communications, your navigation, your oxygen, your, your suit pressure for your G suit. We can talk about that. We wear a, what's called an anti-G suit, which is an inflatable bladder that fits from about here all the way down and wraps around both my legs. We okay. wear them in fighters also mm -hmm. to help keep the blood from pooling in your lower extremities. This G suit will inflate. So we wear a G suit when we're in the, uh, when in the seat. And like, again, I would get strapped in this thing, lying on my back with my feet up in the air, head tilted slightly downward probably for three hours before we actually launch. So it gets a little bit uncomfortable after a while. You want to hurry up and launch just so you can get out of that weird position. Once you're up there and you get out of your seat, now these seats are fully collapsible. You take the parachute out, you take the cushions off, you store them someplace. The, suit fold, the seat folds down, the headrest folds down, the whole seat comes up out of the floor, and then we strap them down in, in, in with and the bungees. So we store them away someplace. You've got the square footage You've got to do the whatever you needed. Footage to do what you need. That is really that's, right. that's pretty slick. It's pretty slick. <laughs> and then when you get ready to come home the night before, you bring them back out again. You unfold them. You bolt them to the floor, and you put the you hook them all up again. And 
And those are things that astronauts have to learn how to do. Yeah. You know, the, because nobody's You want to make sure your seat's in there Absolutely. because you don't want to come back. Absolutely. No. Yes. No. Like, I can remember on, uh, I guess, my first flight, because I was, I was the flight engineer. I was the one that actually set these things up. And I was, because of where my seat was located, I actually helped everybody else to get strapped in and strapped myself in last. Yeah, okay, so yeah. you, uh, others strapped you in when you were when here. When we launched, okay. that's right. So who strapped you in when you were in space? I strapped myself in because I helped everybody else get strapped in first. How did you get first. tight enough? Because I can't get myself <laughs> tight enough in the race car. I did. You yeah, did? Yeah, I did. I sure did. I got myself in. The, I can remember we were actually doing the deorbit burn and I'm still strapped again. But I got it all done and pulled my my straps down and got my suit all hooked up and got the comms working and so on and, and ready to go by the time we uh, hit what we call entry interface. Uh -huh. Well, I can remember doing all of that. Dang. Yeah. And that's part of, your, part of your training. There is so much to space flight training that may not be apparent. People know you're climbing a rocket and go, but they're going to realize all of the little nuances, little behind the scenes things that you have to learn so to do. From the time you found out that you were going to get to go to the time you actually got to go, how long was that period? Well, from the time I was selected for a flight a year. But how long did you train before that? I had been training for about three years. I flew after about four and a half years, which was relatively soon. Some people wait 10 years to fly or six years, and some people, unfortunately, don't get to go at all. Mm -hmm. That's usually. Uh, it's usually uh, the case. Yeah. yeah. You, I mean, it's usually because they something happens. They they perish. They they you know we lose people in training mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason. But I flew after about four years, four and a half years of my first flight, which was again was relatively relatively quick. Hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we both have a common affiliate. Okay, we both have our Florida Tech gear yes. on. I drive the Florida <laughs> Tech Jet Dragster. Mm -hmm. What do you do for Florida Tech right now? I'm and get, what have I'm you get, done? I'm an administrator. I've been at Florida Tech for 11 years. <clears throat> My first four years was Dean of the College of Aeronautics. And Aeronautics, of course, has all the airplanes and the flight programs. Then I was promoted to Senior Vice President for External Relations and Economic Development. And that's a long title for a person that really does a lot of uh, uh, not public relations, but gets the university out into the community. For example, I was on the board of the Economic Development Commission, the EDC. I'm on the King Center Board. I'm on some other boards. So the university becomes uh, a, a part, and we do have a very brand new fledgling research park. So, uh, so I'm, I'm an administrator now. I don't get to teach a full load of courses, but I do get to do some special topics from time to time that obviously have to do with uh, aviation systems, space flight, space flight systems, spacecraft, uh, navigation, living and working in space, and so on. And I get to direct the Advanced Jazz Ensemble oh, man. at Florida Tech. <laughs> because we have a music program. We have a music program. As I mentioned, people who study science and engineering are quite often musicians. So now we're going to stop at one more stop before our tour is over. And I know this isn't necessarily your where you stay, right. but explain to me what this is. This is actually sleeping quarters. It's a, a sleeping quarter uh, a arrangement for International Space Station. And uh, as you can see, it's a nice little cubicle. Uh, the astronaut can float himself or herself inside and normally inside they'd have a desk and they'll have headphones for the, the reading material or for uh, iPods or whatever they want mm -hmm. to look. All your stuff is inside there. And you can close yourself up there and give yourself some privacy. And it's your sleeping quarters. So when you get ready to go to sleep, you float inside there. There's a sleeping bag inside there that's, that's, that you can that you zip yourself up and the bag keeps you from floating all over the quarters. This is individual sleeping quarters for the space station. When I was on the space shuttle, of course, we didn't have these, but we did on one mission have what we call sleep stations. Sleep stations were just horizontal compartments mounted. This is vertical here. They were mounted horizontally on More the like wall. More like a cot, like you would see like kinda in a like submarine a, or something like, like that? Kind of like a cot, but, mm -hmm. but you can close them off. Okay. You have your individual station. Okay. And again, you, have, you float up to it and lie down, float yourself inside, and you're lying down horizontally like this. And, you know, somebody's up here, somebody's there, and somebody's there like bunk beds. Then you can close your door, and it gives you privacy. You've got your reading lamp, you've got your music, you've got uh, uh, all your, your personal stuff inside that gives you a little bit of privacy. Did it take you a while to learn to sleep in space? Yeah, you know, I don't know if you ever really, you just, 
you just Adapt pass out. It. You're yeah, just, just like, you're out. so tired it from is, all the work. It is so strange trying to sleep in space because first of all, you can't lie down. There's no lying down in mm -hmm. space. You can't feel a lying down position. Uh, we, we know what position we're in by our inner ear. Okay. Okay. Or, or, uh, we all know that we, we're standing up. We know we're standing. We feel ourselves standing up. If I bend over to the left, I feel myself bending over to the left. If I lie on my back, I feel myself lying on my back because my inner ear adjusts to the gravity and tells me what. Up there, there's no gravity and the fluids in the inner ear just sort of float around. So you don't, you, your body can become confused and it just feels so strange because there is no lying down position. Your body just, it just feels as though it's all over the place, so to speak. So it takes a little bit of getting used to, to sleep. Plus, like you said, you're so excited about being there, difficult to sleep. But after a while, you make do and you, and you, you manage. So one last thing, if you had any advice to give to a young, aspiring, young Winston, you know, <laughs> what would you tell them? I mean, how to get started, what would you tell them to do? I would tell them that first of all, Science, technology, engineering are so exciting. The real thing is so much more exciting than what you see on the movies. They go to movies to watch Star Wars, maybe Star Trek, and maybe some of the others, but the real thing is so much more exciting. And I would tell them that it's all open and available to you if you just prepare for it. I would tell the students right now to get a good education, you know, uh, study your math, your science, all of your subjects, math, science, English, and so on, and excel in those subjects and uh, go for it because it's open and it's expanding. We're going to be sending more and more people into space in the future. So there's going to be more demand and more opportunities for those who prepare. So I would just urge them that it's, it's the most amazing thing anybody could ever do in their lives is travel in space and the opportunities are there. Well, thank you so much for taking so much of your time oh, this and my pleasure. donating it to the students. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, you have given me goosebumps <laughs> this whole time. This is a dream of mine to be able to sit and to talk to someone like you. I mean, I go fast, but man, you are <laughs> the man. Okay. Uh, so thank you so this much. And I appreciate pleasure. it. And kids, mm -hmm. this could be you. Thank you very, very much.